Hello again, this is part 3 of week 6 lecture uh, and we're going to dive even deeper to look at uh, a few additional architectural and decorative features of a mosque complex in the Nusantara region. So by the 18th century, I think we're beginning to see a typology emerging in island Southeast Asia where the Taju uh, in the form of the multi-tier roof and the minaret that accompanies the mosque and is usually situated within the mosque complex are becoming uh, some of the more common architectural features of a mosque. Uh, so let's look at what the minaret can tell us about a Indian Ocean history uh, to mosque architecture. As our week's reading suggests, how mosque architecture developed is really part of a larger narrative where trade and Sufism, which is a mystical practice associated with Islam, played a central role in the spread of the Islamic faith across the Indian Ocean into Southeast Asia. When it comes to the minaret design, uh, this is an architectural feature that can also be found in a place called Hadramaut in Yemen, uh, where the Hadrami people originated from. Uh, so some of you might have heard of who the Hadramis are, uh, but among the Hadramis, uh, uh, there are specific families uh, who claim descent from the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the male progeny of these families normally carry the title Sheikh in their name, or Sayyid, and the female descendants uh, would sometimes carry the title Sharifa. Of course, this was much more particular uh, back in the old days when being a Sheikh or a Sharifa, you're required to have your genealogical papers, which is called the Salsila. In effect, you're able to trace your lineage all the way back to the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Ali. And in doing so, what you're able to do is also claim certain authority in matters of religion by being, by virtue of being in a direct line of descent from the Prophet himself. And of course, not just the Prophet himself, but all the way back to the first man, Adam. Uh, and this often translates as social privileges. Uh, uh, in this manner, whenever they went, uh, uh, the Hadramis, the Saeeds, would often intermarry with the local elite class, thereby occupying important social positions within Malay society, and in some instances even assumed the throne and were declared sultans, such as the Sultan of Pontiana in Borneo. Back then, being a Saeed came with huge privilege. This included uh, requiring other non-titled Muslims to demonstrate respect towards uh, the descendants of the Prophet uh, by kissing uh, their hands. In a sense, the Hadramis played a central role in the formation of an early modern Malay culture. Depending on specific locations, very often they would intermarry and therefore find a way to assimilate into the elite structure of Malay society. And this was possible principally because, as I suggested uh, in our previous lecture, the prevailing concept of the stranger king allowed for the absorption of external ideas and the transformation and making sense of these external ideas on one's own terms. And this therefore made Malay cultures a lot more hospitable to influences from other parts of the world. In effect, some anthropologists uh, such as uh, Professor Taib Osman would even suggest uh, to think of Malay culture like a, a medicine cabinet belonging to a Malay magician. 
And in, them, in this medicine cabinet, typically what you would find are ointments and potions and herbs from all different parts of the world. At the same time, as much as these are Chinese herbs, Korean ginseng, uh, uh, Indian powders, uh, when they come together in the Malay magician's medicine cabinet, they are repurposed uh, on terms that are meaningful to the Malay magician. So besides the minaret, another important feature that is perhaps more decorative than architectural can be found in the multi-tiered roof of the mosque. Typically, uh, when we look at the highest tier of the multi-tiered roof, uh, these the tier is uh, are su the tier is supported by four central columns, and in Javanese these are called the soko guru, uh, meaning the four central uh, teacher columns. Uh, in many of the older mosques, uh, you would find that one of the pillar is made up of wooden splinters held together by a metal band, as opposed to others that will hold trunk, tree trunks in and of themselves. And this uh, specifically relates to a particular Javanese uh, um, culture in how they remember the coming of Islam as being brought to the island of Java by nine uh, Islamic saints called the Wali Songo, or the Nine Saints of Islam. And it is in the teachings and stories surrounding these Nine Saints that uh, one would begin to appreciate the syncretistic quality of how Javanese try to make sense of uh, Islam within a particular Javanese context. Uh, so. Uh, when we come back to what we're seeing here uh, in this architectural feature, when you notice, what you notice is that above the multi-tier roof, uh, one often sees that capping the apex point of this pyramidal multi-tier roof, uh, you would find a sculptural object, uh, and this would often be made with clay. Uh, so in Malacca alone, uh, there are up to 38 mosques that contain such a decorative feature, even up to today. Uh, so at first glance, it might look very abstract to you. Uh, though abstract, I think the sculptural object has some resemblance to a kind of plant shoot with sinewy petals or leaves opening outwards in blossom, right? Uh, so we know very little about the origin of this decorative feature, although some research have, suggest that, have suggested that as unique as a moss architectural feature as uh, the, finial, the crown finial appears to be, we could actually locate this decorative feature within a much wider cultural space, a very transnational cultural space that spans Arabic, Persian, and Indic cultural imagination. In this sense, if we were to describe an Arabic cosmopolis, it wouldn't only be Arabic in the purest sense of the word, uh, or how we like to imagine what being Arabic means, connected principally only to the Middle East. And unlike Sanskrit, I think it was also a language that did not necessarily only express power through uh, means of consolidation, but actually by mediating uh, references. So what I'm suggesting here is that Arabic allows for the mediation of various kinds of cultural realities that it came into contact with. Uh, an example can be found in a possible source for the Makota Atta or the crown finial that we see capping all the uh, mosque architecture in the Nusantara here. And this can be gleaned from a compilation, an illustration found in a compilation of Sanskrit and Persian sources of treaties on astrology and magic. 
It was commissioned by a uh, Dakini Sultan, Sultan uh, in the 16th century, and this is in uh, middle of India. And what's interesting about this compilation is that uh, of Sanskrit and Persian tr uh, astrological and uh, astromagic sources is that the the book, the Nujum itself, uh, was not only a book of divination. It was also considered as what is called a mirror of princes. And this is a very specific Islamic genre of literature uh, where the mirror of princes serve principally to instruct uh, and educate uh, princes or future royalties how to become obedient servants of Allah and how to do good by way of practicing good governance. So observe how the kingly figure in the illustration here is sitting above uh, what appears to be a seven-story throne. And as he sits centrally composed on his very or ornamental and elaborate august-looking throne, uh, we also see that he is sheltered by a canopy and interestingly the canopy itself is capped with a finial. I think there is a very interesting resemblance to the crown finial that we find in Southeast Asian uh, mosque architecture. So what's happening there? I think there isn't one name for this thing. It has been called variously a kapala som, and som refers to soma, which is like a plant that would uh, allow you to alter your consciousness and expand your mind. Right? So uh, uh, a kapala som is like the head of uh, the som plant, uh, meaning uh, the, the crown of enlightenment. Uh, and then it's also called the hyasan kamuncha, which is, Yasan is decoration, and Kemuncha is peak. So a decorative feature sitting on the peak of an architectural building. And finally, it's also known as the Makota Atap. Atap is the roof, and Makota means the crown. So the crown that sits on the roof. Also known, uh, uh, in, uh, it's also known in Javanese as a Mustoko or a Memolo. Typically, in the Malay language, uh, the equivalent would be a mustika or a mastika, and this translates as a rare jewel, right? Uh, so, yet, what's interesting is that the decorative roof uh, what it represents is this very interesting capacity to speak contiguously uh, across seemingly different cultural spaces and vastly different religious ideas. And what I mean by contiguous is that it serves as a very interesting bridge. Uh, what I'm stressing here is the word seeming, only because in pointing to how the Makota can on the one hand sit comfortably within the Sanskritic uh, Hindu-Buddhist uh, uh, universe as a as a symbol of the apex point to Mount Meru, on the filial tip uh, to the canopy that shelters the Buddha uh, uh, in a mandala sculpture, I think it, uh, this Makota was also at the same time drawing cultural legitimacy and legibility within the Islamic imagination through a new set of Persian-made cultural references that associate or connects the filial uh, with the crown of a king. And in this association, the crown or the apex point symbolizes just rule and just governance at the heart and center of an ideal Islamic society. In this sense, the Makota that sits on the roof of a mosque, uh, interestingly, is resting on a very 
historically charged scaffold that references Mount Meru and also the Chakrabartin or the Buddhist universal ruler on the one hand. But what it does is that it aligns this universalism with a new religious paradigm, that of Islam, in order to formulate what just rule might look like at its most fundamental level. In which case, uh, we could even argue it is not necessarily the institution of kingship or the istana that is at the heart of this political program. Uh, it is the mosque uh, that is situated within the community as a hub that binds a local community together. Uh, and this makes visible also that just rule was something that was thought to be most patently manifest through some form of local civic participation that the mosque enables. Finally, there is also uh, on the uh, multi-tiered roof often uh, a decorative feature that sits at the edge of the roof in, an, uh, in a form that looks like an upward sweeping ridge. Of course, it's not a ridge uh, feature. It is a decorative feature that sits on the ridge itself. Uh, and this then takes us to uh, a, a cultural historical context that perhaps we are more familiar with. So the political prominence of uh, and dominance of Majapahit as a sea-based empire, this meant that as different parts of Southeast Asia came under its influence and became vassal states of the Majapahit Empire, uh, Javanese cultural forms were subsequently adopted in many parts of Southeast Asia. In turn, uh, as we look back at what constitutes Javanese culture under the Majapahit period, it was also uh, a result of a process of active adoption and translation, principally refashioning many of the Hindu Buddhist Sanskritic concept uh, belonging to Sri Vijaya and refashioning them on uh, new terms suited to the Javanese temperament. Therefore, uh, earlier we have seen how the Mutara was an artifact uh, that could be found along the Straits of Malacca. What happens is that we often assume that uh, with the decline of Buddhism and the conversion of the Malay population uh, into Islam, cultural forms from the Hindu-Buddhist past no longer figures within the artistic horizon of traditional Malay arts that were created or developed or more closely associated with Malay culture during the Islamic period. That's, however, an assumption, and I think we need to look more closely at artifacts to realize uh, the degree of creative translation that is at play here. So let's look at, for example, the uh, door frame uh, that decorates a mimbar. A mimbar is a lecturing pulpit. Uh, normally placed within a mosque in which the Friday sermon is delivered. And so the example that you see here is the Palo, uh, one from Palopo and another one from Bhutan, uh, Bhutan both in uh, uh, Sulawesi. And you'll notice that uh, the decorative arch it might resemble something that you have seen earlier in the course. Uh, and if you were to think harder, you would uh, perhaps realize that it vaguely resembles that of the Kala Makara. And the Kala Makara is a uniquely Southeast Asian configuration, uh, normally appearing uh, as arches that frames 
entrances into the temple and more importantly it metaphorically conveys the idea of moving between one space into another marking the passing of time at the center of this movement and the role that portals play in facilitating our access uh, into spaces of spirituality and knowledge. Again, this decorative feature can be found in many different types of wood carving designs. Uh, this not only appears in the form of uh, framing door arches, but also in grave design. So one of the most common uh, grave designs that we can think of that have emerged in this part of the world is the Batu Ace. What's interesting about the Batu Ace, of which this is a very stylized version of it, is that you can also see how the Kala Makara uh, design uh, is in many ways stylized and further abstracted, uh, taking on a much more floral form, uh, but nevertheless speaks to a really long relay of cultural conversation through which we can trace much more recent Malay woodwork uh, to a historical past that we often do not associate with uh, artistic practice that we consider as traditional Malay craft today. All right, so in our last section, we're gonna look very quickly at gravestones and this will be explored much more extensively uh, in the assigned reading for this week. Uh, and specifically, really challenging the way we understand what is called the Batu Ace. In fact, uh, when it comes to evidences of the coming of Islam into this part of the world, uh, pretty much what has survived the test of time are inscriptions on gravestones, many of them pointing to the 14th century as a significant historical moment where we begin to see an increase in uh, the availability of these uh, Islamic gravestone markers. This is not to say that earlier gravestones do not exist. Uh, there's always the possibility of finding um, earlier ones that might point to the coming of Islam uh, to much earlier period. But given the, the, the scale uh, in which uh, gravestones dated to the 14th century are found, uh, discovered, I think uh, this also shows that this was a period where you begin to have a sense of more and more communities rather than individuals uh, be, are beginning to accept Islam as the new religion. Therefore, in many of the gravestones dated to the 14th century, what's interesting is that uh, with this variety, we really get a sense of the complex negotiation that was taking place. So uh, looking at uh, examples from the Minye Tujo tombstones in Pasai, dated to the 14th century, uh, what you got a sense was that uh, there were tombstones that were inscribed in the historical Kawi script, uh, expressing uh, information in Old Malay uh, at the same time as there was also the introduction of Arabic script and language uh, and these tombstones are sitting side by side next to one another. What they could possibly suggest uh, is not so much that there were conflicting realities uh, that were irreconcilable. Instead, uh, what they suggest uh, was that there were numerous cultural references laid out now in front of a person living through that 
crucial period of transition and he or she uh, would have the option to choose how best to express his or her identity. So that was Pasai uh, in the island of Sumatra. Uh, a parallel example could be seen in uh, the Majapahit capital uh, where uh, uh, Hindu kingdom itself also underwent uh, conversion. Uh, therefore, some of the earliest uh, Islamic tombstones on the island of Java uh, can be found in Trowulan. Uh, of course, this uh, set of tombstones do, of course, also uh, capture the intricate and very intimate process uh, of transitioning uh, where we have both Kawi and Arabic scripts being used at the same time testifying to a process in which uh, the local population is negotiating between two different realities. So typically, uh, in Islamic culture, there is a tendency to discourage uh, those who are living from over-commemorating the dead. Uh, uh, believing, uh, it is a belief that stems from the injunction that forms of over-commemoration might lead one religiously astray uh, towards idolatry or worshipping uh, other gods or other beings other than Allah. Uh, therefore, there, there really was a tendency to downplay the decorative quality of tombstones. Uh, and in general, they do appear less ornate. Having said that, there is a particular tombstone uh, tradition, artistic tradition, that did emerge in this part of the world and is well known. Uh, the type of tombstone is called the Batu Ache, and from the name itself, uh, one can guess that it is connected to Ache, which exists, uh, uh, which is a, currently a province of Indonesia, uh, and it's located uh, on the northern tip of the Sumatra island. So what's interesting about the Batu Ace is that uh, uh, the scholarship uh, on the Batu Ace have uh, tended to overemphasize, in fact, its uh, transnational connection, specifically to a tombstone artistic tradition that originated in the Gujarat and principally uh, many scholars have referred to a very specific grave uh, in Pasai uh, that bore formal resemblance to the Gujarati uh, typology and therefore used this to account and explain for a kind of cultural transfer uh, across the Indian Ocean uh, that later on evolved into what is known as the Batu Ace. Um, however, uh, if, you are, uh, if you pay attention to the arguments made in this week's reading, I think uh, the author is suggesting that uh, a much more complex picture needs to be a taken into account. Uh, why is that? Uh, principally because uh, this particular grave in the Kuta Karuang uh, was really only one of the many different types of great, uh, tombstones that one could find in the Pasai graveyard. And it was not uh, the most common, in fact, uh, well, if you were to look at uh, surrounding examples, one would find, for example, uh, many of the Pasai, early Pasai uh, tombstones uh, taking on 
a different form. Uh, typically, this form is much smaller in size compared to uh, the example that you saw before. It uh, takes the form of a rectangular body with a tapering neck that is then level at the top uh, with a flat. In fact, these examples that I'm showing here, as opposed to the ones that you see here, more closely resemble the earliest type of Batu Ace uh, that has been identified, which is the type A form uh, that you see here on the screen, right? Uh, so later on, Batu Ace would acquire a much more volumetric form existing as solid three-dimensional uh, uh, markers. Uh, but in its earliest manifestation, uh, you, what you see here on the screen is that it still prioritizes uh, its, uh, the frontality of its inscription surface. Uh, but what you see in this example here on the screen is that uh, in the top half of the rectangular portion of the gravestone, you see two jutting, uh, upsweeping uh, uh, design element uh, that is reminiscent of a roof, the roof construction that draws on this history of how the color makara can then be further stylized and abstracted. Uh, this still from its, uh, its um, figurative form uh, over time into something that is much more abstract and can be expressed principally through lines. And just to give you more examples of how uh, the Batu Ace will later on really became an export art of Ace into different parts of Southeast Asia, principally uh, commissioned and bought by local elites uh, from different parts of the Malay archipelago. So rather than think of the Batu Ace as being a artistic tradition that can be classified according to different typology. I think the week, this week's reading is suggesting, uh, what it's suggesting is the immense amount of versatility through which um, carvers of these tombstones in trying to create a marker uh, for the purpose of commemoration drew on the cultural resource uh, that they inherited uh, from their locality, from our part of the world, uh, and repurposed them uh, towards uh, new forms of thinking about what it means to remember a person. Okay. And this type of remembering is uh, significant because uh, on many different levels, it is connected to uh, ideas of power, uh, not necessarily directly linked to the person being commemorated, and rather it is more connected to a particular site in which uh, the power was discovered. In this sense, uh, there is also a dimension that is connecting uh, ideas of commemoration and remembering to a specific idea of the landscape and how one understands uh, uh, a person's relationship to a particular place. So this relationship is often expressed in the form of karamat reverence or karamat worship. This is something that is no longer practiced within Malay society uh, due to uh, changes in uh, uh, understanding of Islam that tends to view these as superstitious forms of 
cultural practices. However, it's very much alive in Indonesia, particularly in Java, where there is a very different interpretation of uh, Islam and how Islam is supposed to be a set of practice and belief system that needs to be in conversation with Javanese local understanding of, of, of the universe. And therefore, uh, it takes on a much more syncretistic blend uh, on the island of Java. But what karamats are, essentially, uh, really defies you know, any uh, one-size-fits-all definition. Uh, it could be the grave of a well-known religious teacher, it could be a particular sacred spot connected to a, an animal or an animal that is regarded as sacred or having magical powers. It can be connected to uh, a person who has experienced hardship or uh, was a victim of an accident uh, that has caused uh, the person to die horribly, or it could also be an, 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 uh, uh, a, a natural formation that uh, takes on an unnatural shape. Uh, so a really unusual looking rock uh, could be seen as possessing power, or uh, a particularly uh, Majestic waterfall could also be one, a well, uh, a, a huge gnarly tree, or even an anthill uh, could be uh, uh, recognized or as uh, containing a karamat. So the karamat are really stores of power uh, that one could access uh, through specific entry points. Uh, in a landscape. Uh, in a way, it's teaching us to sort of like look at our environment uh, in a specific way. It's uh, allowing us to read our surrounding uh, through the lens of power. This, pa this is power that can be petitioned, it can be manipulated, it can be redirected uh, towards helping us to obtain what we want in life. Uh, therefore, in thinking about the relationship between the dead and the living through the lens of Islam, at least how it plays out in Southeast Asia, uh, from the example of the Karamat, we see an interesting Sufistic culture that has developed in this part of the world, uh, principally uh, respecting the injunction against overly investing in one's commemoration of the personhood. Uh, rather, uh, it recognizes the moment of death or the moment of commemoration as, a, 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 as an opportunity to really tap into something that is much deeper, uh, that is to use this knowledge of remembering and redirecting this remembrance towards shaping a new reality. In many ways, I think that is really the story of Islam in Southeast Asia. It is a story about translation. Translation. It is a story about negotiation. It is a story about making sense of the past, redirecting it, and channeling it towards a desired future. A future that is perceived to be much more democratic because it is participatory. It is just because Everyone has a stake in uh, the concept, in realizing and actualizing the concept of the just king through their participation in the community 
that is built around the mosque. 